Will dust destroy spacecraft moving between stars? Will the planets align? And what will that do to Earth? And does dark matter interact with itself? All this and more in this week's question show. Welcome to the question show your questions, my answers as always, wherever you are across my channel, if a question pops into your brain, just write it down, I'll gather them up and I'll answer them here. All right, let's get into the questions. Dr. Wael Al Rifai. Assuming we make that antimatter engine work, do we have a material that makes a spaceship going at 50% of light speed withstand a piece of sand in space? What kind of materials would that be? So this is based on an interview that I did with Andrew Higgins. He's an engineer uh, and was proposing interesting ideas on how we could try to do interstellar speeds to be able to reach another star system within a human lifetime. And time and time again, we get the same comment over and over. And clearly, we should have covered this in the episode. But I don't know, it was a, uh, you know, I, I just didn't bring this up. And so Andrew has been patiently answering this question over and over and over again. So yes, when a spacecraft is traveling in between stars, it is passing through the interstellar medium and that if you are going at relativistic speeds, you are going a significant portion of the speed of light, then you are going to be impacting the interstellar medium and tiny particles at relativistic speeds. And you might ask yourself, okay, that sounds dangerous. Like, is that going to be like nuclear bombs hitting the front of this spacecraft? And the cool thing is that this can actually be tested. So we'll break down the particles into two different types. So the first thing is just ions. So mostly it's going to be hydrogen, some helium, occasionally, you're going to get some other kind of, of ion, but it's just going to be individual atoms. And that's you're going to hit lots of that as you pass through space. And you're moving at relativistic speeds, they could potentially be moving at high speeds. And so these particles are going to be having the equivalent of mega electron volts of energy, and they're going to be imparting that energy directly into your spacecraft. And so what's cool is that this can be done in the lab, you can actually do experiments where you are accelerating ions at relativistic speeds, and you are just firing them at whatever would be the leading material on your spacecraft. And what research has found is that it's not very much that you could travel, say, a light year through the interstellar medium, and you're going to have like a millimeter of your material ablated away by the interstellar medium. So you don't have to worry about the interstellar medium at all, like unless you were planning to have more than four millimeters of aluminum on the front of your spacecraft. The second thing is interstellar dust grains. And these are small, like these are going to be micrometer sized, uh, and even smaller. And so when these things strike the spacecraft, yes, they are going to do they're going to release a lot of energy, but not a lot of energy. So you can imagine these things are going to release a few joules of energy each time they strike the front of the spacecraft. And so that's the equivalent of like a firecracker or a camera flash going off against the front of the spacecraft. And it really comes down to how much of this interstellar dust is this? Yeah, if you hit a tiny little asteroid, your spacecraft is done. If you hit something that's maybe even millimeter sized, it's probably going to cause catastrophic damage to the spacecraft. But it is just assumed, estimated, believed that there isn't that much of those larger particles that there's nothing larger than just really the small dust in between stars. But this is one of those big questions that we just properly don't know the answer to. NASA is considering an upcoming spacecraft called the interstellar mission. And despite the name like that sounds really cool, right? Wouldn't it be great to have a spacecraft that goes to another star, but actually, it's just going to go to interstellar space. And so it's going to fly out through the heliosphere of the sun, get out into interstellar space and just try to measure the amount of both the ions that are smashing up against it as well as the smaller dust grains. And it won't be traveling at relativistic speeds. And so the dust is going to do any damage at all. But it's going to be able to count 
all of those dust impacts and then be able to make an estimate of how much there is. And there are other spacecraft in the solar system right now that have the capability to do a rough estimate of those dust grains. Think about NASA's New Horizons spacecraft. It has the ability to detect dust grains like it knew when it was out of the Kuiper belt and it was surprised to find that it was going into a second Kuiper belt or some extension of the Kuiper belt because it has this dust sensing instrument on board the spacecraft. So, you know, for a lot of people, they think, okay, relativistic, like if we can develop antimatter drives, the relativistic speeds are going to destroy our spacecraft. And it looks like that's probably not going to be the case. You probably noticed the Star Trek planet name that appeared above my shoulder. And this is a way for you to vote for you to tell me what you thought was the best question or the best answer, or you know, whatever. Uh, this is the way. And this week, the vote was overwhelming the question from Fractured Gamer about what I thought about city lights that James Webb had seen 7 trillion miles away. And that le led me to go on an epic rant about how YouTube is letting all of this AI content just take over everything on the platform. And uh, yeah, if people like that answer and, and question, I guess. So uh, thanks everyone for voting. Now we're going to put a different planet name up each question and then just wait to the end of the episode and then you can vote for what you thought was the best question of the week. And we'll put the names in the show notes and they'll be at the chapter headings. So don't forget to vote. Tuck theme 0834. Is an alignment of all the planets actually possible? And what are the potential effects on Earth? So I'll deal with the second part first, what are the potential effects on Earth? And if all of the planets imagine you've, you're like sitting here on Earth, and you see Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, all lined up in space perfectly within a tiny little area in the sky. What are the effects on Earth? Absolutely nothing. There is no effect whatsoever that you experience more gravity from the moon than you do from all of those planets. You experience more gravity from a mountain nearby than you do from all of those planets. It is nothing. It's insignificant, but it's really cool. And actually, a couple of years ago, we were able to see Saturn and Jupiter. They came so close in the sky that you could look at them with a telescope and see both of them in the same field of view, which was pretty cool. I did it. Um, you know, a lot of people were live streaming, showing you what it looked like for, for a couple of weeks there. It was a really neat view to be able to look at both. And there was this time back in the 19, late 1970s when NASA engineers were planning out the Voyager spacecraft and they realized that you're going to get this really interesting alignment of all of the giant planets in the outer solar system. Now they weren't going to be lined up, but they were going to be sort of oriented in a way where you could do a flyby of each of the planets. So you could go past Jupiter, you could do a flyby of Jupiter, get a speed boost, go past Saturn, get a speed boost, go past Uranus, get a speed boost, and do a flyby of Neptune. This is called the Grand Tour. And it only happens every few hundred years. And yet it was a great opportunity to take advantage of this really cool alignment. But you know, alignment is not a great because it was like a curve they were able to follow. But you know, all of the planets are going around the sun, if you just sort of wait long enough, there will be a time when all of the planets are say, in the same half of the sky, but it's not going to happen soon. So imagine like half of the sky 180 degrees, you could be standing out. And you could see all of those planets that I mentioned all there in the sky at the same time. Uh, but you won't see that until the year 2492. There's an astronomer named Chris Baird who did a great answer on this question. So I'm sort of stealing that answer from from him. Now, could you get all of the planets in the solar system lined up so that they're like in the same telescope view? And the answer again is yes, um, that, you know, all of the planets are on varying angles compared to the sun, some will be orbiting higher than others, others will be orbiting lower. So you need this time when they're not only at the same sort of lined up from the sun, but in fact, all of their inclinations have all lined up so that they're all in the same degree in the sky. But it's going to take trillions of years, which is longer than the age of the universe longer than obviously, how long the solar system is going to survive. But if you're patient, then yeah, there could be a time when you could see all of the planets in your telescope eyepiece, all collected together in an area around the say the size of the moon, it just would be longer than 
many stars would last. Weldon Anderson 5124. If dark matter doesn't interact with itself or others through friction, does this mean that it doesn't have conventional ways of losing angular momentum? This is what astronomers believe is true about dark matter, that it doesn't experience the traditional friction and loss of angular momentum. So I'll give you sort of an example of this. When we have material that is orbiting around a black hole, for example, you know, all of this material has fallen into the black hole, and it hasn't sort of had a direct hit into the event horizon, the black hole. And so the tidal forces tear things apart. But there's enough friction of interaction between all these particles that they get smeared out into this large rotating disk around the black hole. And then all these little particles are bumping into each other, and they are slowing down, and they are spiraling in and eventually, they all start to fall into the black hole bit by bit. And this is a quasar, we see all of this material actively feeding into the black hole and it's blasting out radiation from the magnetic fields that are swirling around the black hole. And that is baryonic matter that is particles, the stuff that we can see and understand. But astronomers when they measure the interactions of dark matter through gravitational lensing, they can see that the dark matter behaves very much like something that doesn't bump into each other, that experiences no friction. And the classic example of this is called the bullet cluster, where astronomers watch this giant collision between galactic clusters. And because there was so much mass involved, so much material, that they're able to look at how the light from behind this cluster was being distorted by the gravity of this cluster. And that allowed them to figure out where all the mass in this area was. And what they found was that you got the stars had passed through each other and it sort of come out the other side. But the dust and gas that was in both of those galaxies had met in the middle and collided and is probably going to start a new star formation at some point. But the dark matter is still with the stars. And so even though these vast clouds of dark matter 10 times as much mass as the rest of the material in the galaxies, even though they came together, they just passed right through each other and as if it wasn't even there. And, and, you know, to have a particle that we can't really perceive that barely interacts with any other part of the universe, and doesn't seem to have much of a cross section, you know, we have plenty of examples of that think about the neutrino, it sort of has the exact same behavior. So dark matter, like when you think about how dark matter behaves, it's very similar to neutrinos, except there's a lot of other characteristics that dark matter needs to have. And so, you know, if you had a cloud of dark matter that was around a black hole, it's not going to go into an accretion disk in the same way it's going to, you know, have these three body gravitational interactions between the particles, which could indeed send particles of dark matter into the black hole into the event horizon and they're, they become part of the black hole. But you're not going to get it in as an efficient process as you do with regular matter that can experience this friction. And so one of the really interesting ideas about trying to detect dark matter is can you find a place where dark matter could be compacted down into an area where it is experiencing enough sort of compression that it starts to annihilate itself and release heat. And so astronomers have thought that you could actually look for dark matter inside various astronomical objects, you could look for excess heat coming out of the sun, excess heat coming out of planets, excess heat coming out of neutron stars. And this could be that particles of dark matter have been caught into three body interactions. So maybe they've gone around the neutron star, and then there's some other particle that they've interacted with, and they end up inside the neutron star. And once they're inside the neutron star, then there's lots of particles that can help try and capture them. And then they get closer and closer together, and then they can heat up and then you get this additional heating that's coming from the neutron star or the planet or the star or whatever. It's theoretical, you know, no one has found any observational evidence, but it's one of the lines that people are looking for. So dark matter is a weird thing, like not only does it not interact physically with regular matter, it doesn't seem to interact with itself. The technical term for this is the cross section. So if you sort of imagine the shape, the cross section of a particle of dark matter, you think about like a car, right? If you have two cars colliding, you can sort of imagine what a car looks like from the front end. But a particle of dark matter has no cross section, 
And so the particles can go right past each other. It's, it's cool. Um, it would be great if we could have some idea of what this stuff is. We know a lot of its behavior, but still it eludes uh, all the attempts to try and actually pin it down. Tropical Tom Garcia, what are the disadvantages of all the non Dobsonian eight inch telescopes that make them not the best choice for a first time telescope user? Are there any advantages to non Dobsonians for rookies? People always ask me what is the best telescope to get and my answer for 95% of everybody is get a Dobsonian, a light bucket. They are relatively inexpensive, they're easy to use, you see a planet in the sky, you can quickly point the telescope at the planet and you're looking at it and you're seeing the rings of Saturn, the moons of Jupiter, craters on the moon, it's fantastic. So what, what are some reasons? In fact, Dobsonians are not the most commonly purchased telescope. So what, what's going on? What is, you know, what are some reasons why I would recommend against a Dobsonian? So in the same class as an eight inch Dobsonian is a Schmidt cast screen. And we think about like the Celestron, the eight inch Celestron, that kind of classic stubby telescope. Um, it's the equivalent of a Dobsonian telescope, but the thing is a lot smaller. It has more optics that are going on to kind of make the thing be able to resolve an image with a smaller tube, but it is smaller and lighter. It's a simpler telescope. If you want to kind of carry the thing around, you can pull the smaller telescope off. You can put it in a little suitcase, but the mount can often be very big and heavy. And so when you consider carrying the mount as well as carrying the telescope, it often sort of nears the same level of complexity as a Dobsonian, unless you're going to be doing some like airline travel. And then I think you don't want to go with the Dobsonian, then you do want to go for a more traditional, say, Schmidt Cascarine telescope. The other thing is that if you want to take pictures, so if you want to take pictures of the night sky, you can do it with a Dobsonian but it's not the simplest way to go. You, there's lots of cool eyepiece rigs that you can put your phone up to your eyepiece so that you can then take pictures through the, but it's not as good as a, an astrophotography telescope that's set up with the right tracking mount, with the right um, camera system, the right filters, things like that, but they're more expensive. And so if you wanna take good pictures of the night sky, you don't want a Dobsonian, you want to go with a more traditional refractor or with a reflector, but with a really strong mount that can handle the load of all of the telescope and all of the camera gear so that it's rock solid. But they cost thousands and thousands of dollars into the tens of thousands of dollars. The other thing is that if you do want to take pictures, you've got lots of money and you don't want to sort of really custom build something, then there's a whole suite of these new computerized telescopes, the Stellina, the uh, EV scope, the Dwarf 2, there's a bunch of them. And I've used them. They're awesome. They work great. They do exactly what you're expecting is that you take this little telescopy gadget that you looks like it comes out of Wally. -E. you put it on the ground, you start it up with an app on your phone, it figures out where it is, and it starts taking pictures of the night sky, you say, I want to see this nebula, I want to see this galaxy. They're amazing. The quality of the pictures they take isn't as good as the ones if you actually built your own telescope setup. And you can't look through the eyepiece. So there's something really magical about looking through the eyepiece and saying, Oh, okay, yeah, that is you know, I'm looking at Saturn right now, you're you're seeing a little picture of Saturn and you can look at a picture of Saturn on the internet anytime you want. But they're so easy to use that if you just if you want to take a picture of, of a comet, then you can just do it. And you set the thing down, take pictures of comets, they're easy to use, they can run all night. And, uh, and they're, they're great, but they're, they can be very expensive, you know, they're in the several thousand dollar range. So the telescope that I that I don't think people should get and like, are the ones that are relatively small and have a fairly uh, flimsy mount that came from a department store or they're, you know, they're $100, $150 on Amazon, like they're not going to be that great. And I recommend like I want you to make the investment to get the proper Dubsonian telescope, spend the 400 ish dollars or build your own 
and you'll be so happy with that telescope forever for the rest of your life. You will never need another telescope than that Dobsonian. You can take it out, do sidewalk astronomy, star parties, show people the night sky. Everyone's going to love it. It's a lot of telescope for the least amount of money. So um, there aren't a lot of situations where I would recommend anything other than a Dobsonian for most people. If you want to support the work we do at Universe Today, consider joining our Patreon club. Your support lets us have a minimum of ads and no sponsorship messages. Patrons get no ads on UniverseToday.com for life. Want the extra parts of the live stream that aren't in this edited version? You can sign up for a special patron-only podcast feed and get the overtime segments as well as other special behind-the-scenes episodes, including our monthly patron-only question show that is like three hours long. Thanks to everyone who has already subscribed and welcome to our recent newcomers, Dennis Alberti, Joaquin Schimpf, Thomas Scott, Miles, Josh Pally, Shekhar, Sebastian Torres Lara, Matthew Jackson, Sixpence Zach, Mark Merlin, JP, and Alexander Terhar. Join the club at patreon.com slash universe today. Edward Hinton, if Webb is so much more powerful than Hubble, why are its deep fields only slightly better? What makes you think that its deep fields are only slightly better? In fact, Webb hasn't done a deep field yet. Webb is doing a couple of surveys. There's one called Cosmos, there's one called Jades, where it is doing some surveys of galaxies that are examples of what you might see in the early universe. But these are a fraction of the time that Hubble did for its deep field, ultra deep field. And yet, for 1 50th of the time, it is able to produce the same quality of deep field images as Hubble did. And so you can go for say, if it took Hubble 50 hours, you can actually get an equivalent image out of James Webb in actually just like a few minutes. So it's a dramatic improvement. And so why hasn't Webb done a proper deep field survey with all of the raw power of this amazing telescope? And the answer is that it's just too busy right now. Like there's just so many people requesting time on this telescope, they don't have time to set it aside to do the kind of deep field that they did with the Hubble Space Telescope. Then it took them a few years before they got into it. Like Webb has only been operating for two years now, not even. So we got to be patient for that. Now, that said, you know, I've talked to astronomers about this very question. You know, when are you going to do a deep field? Are you, are you planning to do a deep field? When's a deep field going to happen? And so right now, there are all of these different groups that are working on these different surveys. Like I said, Jades, Cosmos, there's others. And they are starting to have these conversations about if we did do a deep field, what would be the place we'd want to look? And how long would we want to look at? And do we want to try to go really wide? Or do we want to go very deep? Do you want to stare at just one area? What's the total size? Do we want to look at the area that's already been done by Hubble? Do we want to try new regions? So it's a complicated conversation and it's going to require a lot of buy-in from a lot of separate groups. And it might be that we just don't see the same Hubble deep field project that we did with Hubble because Webb can kind of just do them all the time, anywhere it wants. It can just stare for a few minutes, boom, instant Hubble deep field. And so I, I do love the idea, and I've done interviews about this and done videos about this, about it just like staring at one spot at the sky for a hundred hours, which it can, it could totally do that. What would it see? Um, but right now, telescope's too busy, and the astronomers have yet to fully agree on what would be their preferred deep field. So stay tuned. Jacob LeBay, if we cured cancer, would astronauts still have to worry about radiation? Huh? Yes. Um, because when there are intense radiation storms, like if you're in the middle of a solar storm, there is so much radiation coming from the sun that you just die from the radiation. It's not about the cancer, you just die. It's like being close to a nuclear weapon. There's a certain distance to the weapon that you're just going to have so much radiation going through you that you're going to die of radiation sickness. Think about the people who died after Chernobyl and things like that. But then it's the long term damage and decay to your DNA that increases your chances of getting cancer years, if not decades down the line. And you see in cases where people were exposed to a lot of radiation, 
a lot of people get cancer after the event. And so if we've got a cure for cancer, then what I'm assuming that means is on the one hand, we can repair the damage to our molecules so that cancer doesn't happen in the first place, or that we're able to find cancer and remove it all before it can cause any kind of risk or damage to the body. And so yeah, if that was the case, then astronauts would no longer have to worry about the long term consequences of, of radiation. And I think you're right, like, like, <laughs> imagine like, if, if one of the benefits of developing techniques for long term spaceflight is that we cure cancer, that would be worth it. Alaska B, how realistic do you think the concept of sophons are from the three body problem? So in the three body problem, the trisolarans send a particle, I'm trying to think of how you describe this, a particle to Earth. And that particle is this gigantic computer that they then wrapped up into a one dimension and were able to send at close to the speed of light to be able to send it to Earth. And the purpose of the Sophons is to mess with humanity to to observe everything we do and to mess with all of our technology so that we can no longer proceed on physics experimentation and present any kind of defense against the Trisolarans when they show up. Hope I didn't spoil the story too much there. Um, so like, how realistic is that? Well, like not. Like, how do you like if you watch the show, read the book, that they are taking this planet wide computer, which we can't make, but you know, we can theoretically figure out how to make that is capable of being everywhere and anywhere and seeing all things and actively messing with technology, which we don't know how to do. And then they're folding it down into the size of a hydrogen atom. We, we don't know how to do that at all. But then and the part that I find so unrealistic about this is that they then shoot them at the Earth at relativistic speeds at 99 point whatever percent the speed of light. How do you slow them down? How do you catch them? So far, should just go right through Earth and just keep going. They are not a problem to us. And yet somehow they're able to be slowed down to arrive at Earth and begin causing mayhem. So um, it's just it's just a story um, and not very realistic. But it's a cool idea. And it's freaking scary when you read it in the book. Kyler Reynolds. Hey, Fraser, do you think gravity waves come in flavors like light waves do? So the electromagnetic spectrum is one single classification for all the different kinds of radiation that are related to to photons. And I don't think people experience this very much like obviously, you know, but most people they don't realize Oh, radio waves, infrared, visible light, ultraviolet, x rays, gamma rays, they're all the same thing. They are all just the photon. It's just what is the wavelength and you can turn infrared into visible, you can turn visible into infrared, it all just depends on what is the redshift or the blue shift of those photons. So I wouldn't necessarily describe them as flavors in the way like, you know, neutrinos come in different flavors or quarks come in different flavors. But photons are just photons. But can you get different wavelengths of gravitational waves? And the answer is absolutely. Um, and in fact, different kinds of of processes in astronomy produce different wavelengths of gravitational waves. And so when you think about the LIGO observatory, the Virgo here on Earth, Earth based gravitational wave detectors are capable of detecting the mergers between stellar mass black holes, and like neutron stars and stellar mass black holes, and maybe neutron stars colliding and maybe white dwarfs colliding with neutron stars. But that's like the entire realm of what and, and that is the wavelength. So the size of the waves that are passing the detectors here on Earth, they can't detect things that have a longer wavelength. And they can't detect things that have a higher wavelength. But there are going to be things that are outside of what can be detected from LIGO. So there are things with much higher frequency. 
and there's going to be things with much lower frequency. And those are going to require different kinds of gravitational wave observatories. And in fact, these are being worked on right now. So a good example of this is, say, LISA the space based gravitational wave observatory that the European Space Agency is going to be launching in the 2030s. And this is going to sort of extend astronomers vision beyond just the stellar mass black holes. And maybe it's going to be able to start seeing the supermassive black holes starting to merge or be able to see sort of longer wavelength gravitational waves. And in fact, there is a hint, thanks to pulsar timing arrays, that it can actually measure this background hum of all of these supermassive black holes merging with each other. And so it's kind of like a telescope. Like when you think about a visible light telescope, it's designed to be able to see in visible light and infrared telescope lets you see an infrared light. And so there are gravitational wave observatories that are going to be built and tuned to the wavelengths that they're going to try to see, which is going to allow them to see certain kinds of astronomical phenomena. Red Streak 1, if a space telescope is built piece by piece like the International Space Station, how big could it be made? So the technique that you're talking about is called on orbit assembly. And this is what was done with the Mir space station and then was improved with the International Space Station. And when you think about the space station, it took about 100 flights of the space shuttle of various rockets from many different countries to be able to launch all of the pieces and parts that came together to build the International Space Station with the astronauts on board, uh, configuring modules with the arms on board being able to pull modules in and then they could be docked together and it was built up over time. I'm sure Chad is showing a really cool animation right now of the International Space Station coming together in bits and pieces. And it is an enormous machine that was built in space. It was very expensive, but it shows that this idea is absolutely possible and it's going to be done again when the Lunar Gateway gets built. So could you use that same technique to build a giant space telescope? And the answer is absolutely. In fact, I've done an interview here on the channel a couple of years ago, I, I should really do another interview with the with the researcher. And the idea was like, what kind of a telescope could you build if you were no longer limited by the constraints of a single launch, and you wanted to break it up over multiple launches, and you could make some really big telescopes. So the the general plan is that you would send up one component called the bus. And this would be the the brains of the telescope, and it would also have little robotic arms coming off of the side of it. And then you would send other parts, you could send, for example, the solar panels for it to be able to power itself, you could send it some kind of sun shield, you could send it the primary mirror, the secondary mirror, and other various parts. And I think the the one that we were looking at was like in the 20 meter class range. And imagine a 20 meter space telescope, but you could go even bigger than that. I mean, it depends on on the tolerances that you're willing to afford. And then it would be a platform that then maybe down the road, as you need to install new instruments, like the thing is thing is designed to be built and improved upon and it's modular. And you could then bring in new instruments, pull out old instruments. And so it would be this really interesting balance between a ground based telescope where you can go over and install new instruments and a space telescope that is completely disconnected from humanity. I mean, we can't make any changes or updates to James Webb, it's done. Now you had this hybrid with the Hubble Space Telescope, but it was never meant to be upgraded. And so it hadn't been planned into it. And people had to get really clever to be able to install the corrective optics and be able to do the upgrades to it. Like this feels almost inevitable to me that we are going to reach this limit on what is the biggest telescope that you just want to stick in a one spaceship and launch in one time that we want to have these telescopes be a facility an orbital facility that has a better transmitter that has better computers on board so it can do data processing that you can have multiple instruments that are connected to it that you can be even pointing in different directions and that it can be with its robot arms just adding and assembling more parts to this giant telescope complex that is orbiting around Earth. And so I wouldn't be surprised in the next couple of decades, we see a future telescope that is going to be in, assembled in space. Peace be upon you. 
Could all the black holes be the results of advanced civilizations, final catastrophic technological disasters? And that's why we're not finding any. Of all of the responses to the Fermi paradox, this would be classified under the great filter. And so there would be this inevitable technology that all advanced civilizations reach where it makes absolutely the most sense to do it. And yet when you do it, then it turns your star, your entire star system into a black hole. I don't think we know of a mechanism that will turn an entire star system into a black hole. Like you need to have all of that mass. You need to have this immense compression from a uh, imploding massive star to actually create a black hole in the first place. But you know, from a science fiction perspective, from a horror standpoint, I, I do find this idea of a science experiment as the explanation for the great filter as kind of compelling. So I'm going to give you an, an analogy a bit, which is sort of one of the ideas about like artificial intelligence, right? You know, we, we know that in the past, people have created nuclear weapons. And at a certain point, the nuclear weapons are only created for various nation states. And there's like a hopefully no one's going to use these nuclear weapons. And you know, everyone knows it would be catastrophic if it was. But with say artificial intelligence, there is a potential existential threat that eventually smart robots will will take control of the future. And you can kind of imagine that how we get there is that the robots are providing us value, providing us value. They're constantly making our lives better until they take over. <laughs> and then all is lost. And so you can imagine some kind of science experiment, some kind of zero point energy machine that is producing unlimited power for all humanity. But if you run them for too long, and if you extract too much energy out of them, then there's just this moment where the whole thing then turns your entire planet into strange matter. And then you create this a uh, bubble of strange matter that just expands at the speed of light that is destroying all of the universe. Was it like Ice Nine uh, in Kurt Vonnegut's book? So, um, do I take them seriously? No, no, I don't. I don't take that idea very seriously. You know, we see the black holes. We see them interacting with their environments. So. Um, and we see them early on in the universe before the elements for life were available. We see them just a few hundred million years after the Big Bang, and they're already super massively big. But boy, it would make a good science fiction story for sure, or a very boring one. And then they turned on the machine and it destroyed the universe. John Vincent Sadik, what's the deal with Sedna? Why is no one trying to meet the 2034 launch window for a mission, the last window for 11,000 years? So Sedna is this really weird dwarf planet, very different from the others that are here in the solar system. It's on this really elliptical orbit that only brings it this close to the sun every 10,000 years or so. And so we're closing in on this time, the optimal time to send a mission to Sedna. But you have to launch quickly, you got to get there 2034 to be able to fly out and then follow it as it heads back out into the outer solar system. Why is nobody planning to to do this? Because there are so many things that astronomers and planetary scientists want to explore. And there's just not enough budget, too many targets. When you think about all of the opportunities, I mean, you could still if you wanted to catch up with Oumuamua and take pictures of it up close. So the same kind of spacecraft that could be sent to Sedna could be sent to Oumuamua. Would you prefer images of the first interstellar asteroid or pictures of dwarf planet Sedna? Suddenly you've got to make some choices. Or you could put an interceptor spacecraft out, and wait for the next interstellar object that's going to come in and send a flyby there. That's kind of interesting. So the problem is there's just too many things to do and not enough money to go around to do all of those things. I mean, there are no concrete plans to go to Enceladus, the place in the solar system where we know there's liquid water, organic molecules, hydrogen gas, and it is being spewed out into space, where all you have to do is take a little cup and just put it into the plume and then just take a little sip to find out if there's any Enceladus krill uh, chewing on your lip. 
uh, but we're not doing that. So like, don't get me started on the things that we could do here in the solar system that we're not doing. I'm, I, I would go on all day. I'm grateful for the really interesting things that are happening. I mean, there's a new solar sail that's going to be launched shortly. There's going to be the Titan Dragonfly. There's going to be a helicopter going to Titan. How cool is that? Um, hopefully Mars sample return mission will work out in some case. Humans are going back to the moon. Um, another rover is going to Mars. The Chinese are bringing back samples from the moon and are going to bring back a sample from an asteroid. It goes on and on and on. Lucy is on its way out to the Trojan belt around Jupiter. And yet we don't have a mission plan for Sedna. What about Triton? Like we need to take pictures up close of Neptune's moon Triton. Just go to the Neptune system. Yeah, I could do this all day. So why not? Because there's no money, not enough priority and too many things to look at. All right, those are all the questions that we got this week. Thank you everyone who posted your questions into the YouTube comments. And thanks to everyone who showed up for the live show. Just a reminder, we record this show live every Monday at 5 p.m. Pacific time right here on the YouTube channel. There'll be a reminder somewhere here on the channel when the next live event is going to happen. Come, it's a lot of fun. Hundreds of space fans chatting with each other, asking me questions. It's twice as long as what you're watching right now. And so you should definitely come and check out the, the live stream. Now I'm going to talk about some media again. But first, I'd like to thank our patrons. Thanks to Abe Kingston, Andrew M. Gross, Dennis Alberti, Dougie Stewart, Dustin Cable, Jeremy Mattern, Jim Burke, Jordan Young, Josh Schultz, Mark Ansis, Modso, Paul Robrock, Stephen Krasaki, Stephen Fowler Munley, and Vlad Shiplin, who support us at the Master of the Universe level. And all of our patrons, all your support means the universe to us. So I had a bunch of people asking me what I thought about some recent media, and so I thought I would just chime in and let you know what I thought. First, Fallout. Uh, I loved it, the Fallout TV show on Prime. It was perfect. It was the exact right combination of silly, weird, and violent. <laughs> and uh, I was here for it. Now I have played all of the Fallout games. It's like one of the few video games that I finished every version of the game. Well, I haven't played Fallout 76, but I've played all the others. And of course, Fallout New Vegas, which is objectively the best one. And so I feel like I was able to get almost all of the references that were made in the show. And yet it also felt fantastic as just a TV show. So is this the best video game adaptation to a television show or movie that's ever been made? I think so. And then the second show that people have been asking me about is the three body problem. Have I seen that the one on Netflix? And yes, I have seen the three body problem on Netflix. I've seen the Chinese version on Tencent. I've read the book. So you know, I feel like I understand the, the show quite well. And I really liked it. Um, it was very different. It was very westernized compared to the, the Chinese version, although a lot of the key characters were still Chinese, which I thought was was great. Um, but I thought it was it was nice to remove a lot of parts that were fairly slow and boring in the first book, like the first book is the worst of the three. And so the less of that book that we have to experience before we can move on to the really cool ideas. I'm fine with that. So um, totally worth watching different. So if you want like to just keep immersing yourself in the three body problem, you can watch the Tencent version, which goes on for 30 episodes. And then you can watch the Netflix version for eight episodes. Both are fine. They're good um, for different reasons. But yeah, I would say definitely worth watching. All right, we'll see you next week.